Hi guys, so as Northern Ireland is part of the single market when it comes to goods and Great Britain is outside the single market and the customs union, we know that this is creating disruption in Northern Ireland. Now, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee invited some representatives of businesses in Northern Ireland to speak to the committee and explain some of the problems that they're facing and how they're overcoming these problems. So let's hear from the committee chairman and some of the people who represent businesses in Northern Ireland. I just say, uh, and I know uh, just to our witnesses, um, just for the record, uh, we much prefer calling people Mr. Campbell or Miss Jones or Mr. Benton rather than rather than Christian names, uh, please, uh, just for formality of the record. Mr. Goodwill. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, no, I'm Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've heard uh, um, that there may be some opportunities for Northern Ireland uh, producers to take advantage of this by supplying more home produced or home uh, manufactured products. But I was talking to a, a bakery owner in County Armagh uh, yesterday, and he was telling me that, that yes, there's opportunities. Uh, he can get all the ingredients for his cakes and for his superb sticky toffee puddings but because he accesses packaging from GB, he finds that he, he's had to stop production <coughs> some of his lines because he can't uh, package them. So I just wondered maybe uh, if Mr. Neil could say, uh, have you picked up any issues where it isn't just a case of a product being um, limited, but the actual ingredients or other elements needed to make that product? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really does carry across whether it's a, an end product or ingredients, or indeed a product you're buying, that they, some of the ingredients in it have you know, um, country of origin issues uh, with it. And I, I, I suppose, look, I mean, if I come at this you know, in a pragmatic sense, will business find a way if we're left with the current protocol the way it is? It will, we will not starve in the hospitality sector, but we will have less choice and um, we'll have higher wastage of product because the delivery days will be longer so our shelf life will be shorter and of all all of that will result in higher costs to the end user uh, and i think this is an encapsulation of brexit there will be less choice there'll be higher wastage and the customer at the end of the day will pay more and you can apply this also also to what's happening in great britain choice will go down wastage will go up um, and as he said you know we will not starve the hospitality industry will not starve he represents the hospitality industry in northern ireland and there is a focus now on sourcing goods from the republic of ireland or also even within uh, northern ireland itself um, there are opportunities but there, you know our, our market develops anyway the, you know, actually, COVID has accelerated the, the consumer trends probably about 10 years. You know, we are very keen uh, to encourage a circular economy and a lot of our, our uh, products where possible. But there are, some, you know, there are huge product ranges that just are by the type of them are huge volume products supplied from the historic wholesale distribution center in GB. I think it's extremely interesting to listen to people who represent the business industry or business owners themselves talking about their experience with life post Brexit, not to listen to politicians because politicians will try to paint Brexit in a positive light. These people are speaking from a practical point of view and they're pragmatic when they're dealing with Brexit. I think it's much, it's refreshing to actually listen to these people because they, you know, their livelihood is at, a, is at stake. Politicians' livelihoods are not at stake. Politicians know that if they mess up, well, you know, they still have a pension at the end of the, their, their time in Parliament. If they mess up, they know that they still have their seat, generally. But a business owner, if they mess up, they risk losing their business, they risk losing their livelihood, and they even risk losing their home in many cases. So they understand the consequences here, and they have to try and work around it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, turning to Mr. Linus, uh, obviously you're uh, operating in Ireland, Northern Ireland and Scotland, um, but I, I wonder if you've picked up any trends where some uh, suppliers uh, or manufacturers are using the 
um, the, the Holyhead um, route rather than the Strand Ra route to try and ease the situation. Have we seen any evidence that that is seen as, a, as an easier or, or less a bureaucratic way of doing things? Or indeed, have some supplies come directly from continental Europe to, to miss out that GB part of the journey? Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Goodwill. Um, I mean, we, we're doing that as a business ourselves. So we, we've moved a lot of, um, you know, supply chain direct uh, into uh, Dublin or Rosslare or, um, you know, fr from that side. And, and purely because actually the, the issue that um, Mr. Neil, I'll have to, it's the first time I've ever called you that, um, but, but that Mr. Neil raised around this warehousing issue of an EU good that used to go to a GB warehouse and then back to the EU, i.e. the island of Ireland. So we've had to find a lot of workarounds um, for that. Now that's okay if you're bringing in, and this is the practical realities, a half container or full container of those goods, you can make that work. And we have um, in a number of examples. And it's the point I made at the very start, our supply chain will just become naturally more all Ireland and, and European. And, and we, will make, we will make the solution work, but where it gets difficult, I think is on smaller product lines. So a good example is an orange juice, a, a, like a nice orange juice we would sell in a coffee shop. We would only need a pallet or two of that. And that was made in Spain, comes to a distribution center in GB, which is now seen as rest of the world or a third state. Um, and then comes back to us if we want to sell that product into Southern Ireland. And I know we keep coming back to that point, but uh, you know the Republic of Ireland is a third of our business. Uh, and so we, we don't want two separate supply chains. So we can't bring that product in yeah. without a tariff going to Southern Ireland of about 12.2% on that product. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to um, source that elsewhere. We have had suppliers in particular, again, rest of the world product, mainly in the chicken, uh, cooked chicken world, you know, your kind of goujons or your bites who are now bringing goods direct into um, Dublin or Ross Lair. That works in some instances, but I've got to be honest, as a, I suppose as a food wholesaler, the Stranraer in particular, or the Larkin Ryan route is an incredibly robust and resilient route. Obviously, we use it every night going to Scotland and we know how resilient it is. So it is a brilliant link. So it's our, it's our preferred option. And it was actually most of our suppliers preferred option purely because of just the robustness of the boats. So, so that, that, that is an issue. We're making it work, but for the smaller orders and more bespoke products, you just can't get. I mean, our desire is always to go, at, you know, Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland for our supply chain. That's what we want to do. But there are moments where we can't. There are products that just, they aren't made either competitively or they aren't made, you know, they aren't made in the island of Ireland. And that is definitely where the challenges have come. So... I think it was very interesting and it's a, a, a real problem. So basically, the, you know, when it comes to large, um, large container, like containers or half containers of goods, it's not really a problem because, you know, that can come from from Europe directly or it can come from the Republic of Ireland. But as he pointed out, when it comes to some niche product or even, as he said, a half contain a half pallet, um, these will just not be feasible anymore. Like the other man was speaking, he said, you know, we're not going to starve, but we're going to have less choice, more wastage. And I think um, businesses in Northern Ireland will adapt. Now, the response from the unionist community is to throw away the protocol completely. But businesses understand we need, you know, stability. If you throw away the protocol, we're going to have instability and this is going to damage businesses. So they're working around the problem. And in some ways, perhaps certain products will no longer be available in Northern Ireland. The market will adapt. It's unfortunate and there doesn't seem to be any other way around it. But I think businesses will adapt. The people of Northern Ireland will adapt to the consequences of Brexit. And in a, perhaps in a way, they're going to build greater links <clears throat> with the Republic of Ireland and with the European Union and this, you know, if there is a, a bigger market in Northern Ireland for a particular product, then there will be distribution centres created in the Republic of Ireland to uh, satisfy that demand. Let me know in the comments section, guys, what you think about all of this. As always, your comments are greatly appreciated. Thanks a lot. I want to say a big, big thank you to all of my patrons. You ensure that this channel continues to exist. I'm eternally grateful for all of your support.
If you join Patreon, you will receive instant access to our Discord server, where we have both audio and video chats. You can chat with me and other patrons, where we discuss important and non-important issues. Becoming a patron per month costs about the same as a large coffee, so why not check it out?